December 1941, war rips through Southeast Asia. Two generals go head to head in a battle for a tiny island in the South China Sea that will shake the very foundations of the British Empire. British General Arthur Percival and Japanese General Tomoyuki Yamashita may be kilometers apart, but in their minds, they stand over the same table. Two modern-day generals will get inside their heads to unpick their tactics and strategy, while a team of military experts compare their equipment and their firepower to reveal just how the Battle of Singapore was won and lost. December 7th, 1941. Japan is about to enter the war with a bang. She plans to attack the Americans at Pearl Harbor and invade the Philippines and British colonies in the Far East in the same night. Her ultimate goal, to push the Western powers out of Southeast Asia and grab its rich natural resources. The man chosen to lead the Japanese invasion of British-held Malaya and Singapore is General Yamashita. He is an unusual figure in the Japanese military. He wasn't the traditional Japanese general. He didn't fit into the box in a, in a comfortable way. He was questioning. He wasn't part of the, of the establishment, if you like. Um, and therefore, he was, an odd, he was the odd ball out. He was too clever by half. Major General Julian Thompson is a former Royal Marine Commando. He is fascinated by Yamashita. He was the son of a village doctor. He went to a military academy to get an education. So he's not from the traditional aristocratic Japanese background. And he's actually a quite senior chap before he starts uh, battle fighting. When he's actually confronted with battle, he's out there leading from the front. And this I think it's very good preparation for what he's about to do. Yamashita wants to kick the British out of their wealthy colonies in Malaya and Singapore. His plan relies on speed and surprise, so he will travel light with a slimmed-down army. He is offered four divisions, but decides to launch his attack with just two. An indication of his intelligence as a general was he resisted the temptation to have more just in case because he knew that it would create a great strain on his logistic resources and might end up in disaster because he was actually half starving everybody in order to cover the whole lot. As Yamashita plots his first move, his adversary takes charge in British Singapore, the newly promoted Lieutenant General Arthur E. Percival. Singapore, I think, was probably one of the more exotic and the more comfortable of the imperial stations. When he was told that he was to be promoted lieutenant general, uh, he must have thought, great, this is marvellous. Singapore was golf, tennis, bridge, the club in the evening, the sundowners, uh, wonderful. Lieutenant General Sir Alistair Irwin is a top-ranking British general with many overseas postings under his belt. And then he thinks to himself, hang on, Singapore. This is either going to be something where I'm going to be drinking gin for the next two years with nothing happening at all, or it's going to be a, 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 a pretty difficult business. Percival fears the island may prove a tempting prize for the Japanese, but he is up for the fight. He's already proved himself in World War I and against the IRA in Ireland. Nobody doubted his courage and his character when things were rough. A, a man who knew his business. I think that, generally speaking, he was thought to be a, 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 what we might in Britain call a good egg. But he does, in appearance, not exactly fit the mould of what you might think a sort of commander uh, might, might look like. And instinctively, soldiers follow people who look good people who just look the part. And I think that that was a, a, a slight Achilles heel of poor old Percival, that to put it bluntly, his mother and father didn't do a great job on the design.
Arriving in Singapore, Percival finds a complacent population. We in Britain had been allies of the Japanese, and, and so we regarded them as friends. Uh, and and the idea that slowly they might be becoming expansionist and that that expansion would be at our expense didn't really dawn on people. The British had rather a disgraceful attitude to the Japanese fighting man. The Japanese couldn't see at night. The Japanese were always wearing thick pebble glasses so that when it rained they couldn't see anything at all. They were far too small to carry anything of any significance on their backs. Well, they just weren't a worthy enemy, really. <laughs> What the British don't know is that the Japanese have been preparing their invasion for a year under Yamashita's chief planner, Colonel Masanobu Suji. Colonel Suji, who later gains a taste for eating his enemy's livers, plots a tropical war down to the last detail. He's a sort of fascist character. Yamashita doesn't like all that much, um, but he's an ace staff officer highly enthusiastic, a driving character, just the sort of chap you need as a chief of staff, provided you have a hand on the back of his neck from time to time and pull him back. Suji wants Yamashita to launch his invasion in the rainy season. He believes Westerners, being very effeminate and cowardly, have an intense dislike of fighting in the rain, or the mist, or at night. Yamashita takes his advice He'll attack at night, in the monsoon. Percival's men are not properly equipped for such a fight. Military historian Andy Robertshaw explains why. The uniform that we see here on our representative British soldier is based on what was worn really at the end of Queen Victoria's reign in the 1890s. So it's old fashioned even by the style of the 1940s. British soldiers have been wearing shorts for a long time and they're great for a desert environment. In a jungle, your legs are very exposed, they get cut and scratched. You're very, very vulnerable to mosquitoes that carry malaria. Boots he's wearing, ammunition boots, developed really for long distance marching on nice dry roads. In a jungle environment, if these things last 10 days, then you're lucky. Really, this whole uniform is not ideal for what we're going to ask him to do when he fights the Japanese. Japanese soldier here is wearing a uniform that's based on recent experience fighting in China. So whereas his uniform is based on what was happening at the end of the 19th century, this is modern. It's light, quite comfortable to wear, designed to combat the heat. These are putties, basically they're bandages that go around your legs. These stop mud and dirt getting into your boots, protect your legs. These things are really good for jungle warfare. Frankly, we couldn't cope with this level of sophistication. We had nothing to match the Japanese. The Japanese preparation was so thorough that the troops knew what to expect. And of course, it gives a soldier huge confidence if he thinks his leaders have done the homework. And when he arrives there, it's exactly as he's been told it's going to be. But Yamashita's plan is still fraught with risk. He wants to put troops ashore in neutral Thailand and British-held Malaya at the same time. His air force will attack British airfields and destroy Percival's planes. Yamashita will use the captured bases to launch his own bombing raids. Then he will push his main force 800 kilometers down the west coast of the peninsula to attack Singapore Island the key British naval base in the Far East. On the eve of the invasion, Yamashita writes a poem in his diary. On the day the sun shines with the moon, our arrow leaves the bow. It carries my spirit toward the enemy. With me are a hundred million souls, my people from the East. Percival gets wind of Yamashita's force heading for Thailand. He considers striking first, but attacking the Japanese in Thai territory will amount to a declaration of war on neutral Thailand. So he hesitates. While he dithers, Yamashita lands. <laughs> Yamashita comes ashore with over 20,000 troops in neutral Thailand fights off the Thai military police 
and quickly head south to the Malay border. He must have felt no compulsion about invading through a neutral country. I don't think that was rated very high on the, on the Japanese radar. But his attempt to land another strike force in British-held Malaya immediately hits trouble. Here, his men face soldiers from the British Indian Army, who are defending Malaya alongside regular British and Australian troops. Percival knows that the odds of stopping Yamashita landing are stacked in his favor. If you can catch an invading force on the beach, you have a pretty good chance of pushing him back into the sea. The enemy is at his weakest when he's putting people ashore. They haven't established themselves on the ground, their commanders are still afloat, and so on and so on. They, they, they are vulnerable. To exploit this advantage, Percival bombs Yamashita's launches as they attempt to put troops ashore. Many go down. But Yamashita runs the gauntlet. He manages to land over 5,300 men on the Malay beach. Then his soldiers have to fight through three lines of barbed wire, past ranks of dug-in infantry and cross a network of waterways under constant artillery and machine gun fire. The Japanese are forced to crawl on their hands and knees through a hail of bullets. Over 800 are killed or injured, but they don't give up. Yamashita's determined men force their way through Percival's defences and overrun the airfield. For the first time, the British realise what they are up against. The Japanese soldier was taught that obedience to the emperor was everything, that death was as light as a feather, that surrender was disgraceful, that being a prisoner was the lowest thing you could be. Tough, frugal, ruthless, very well trained, and the Japanese soldier was a very, very superior, fine soldier. Despite his heavy losses, Yamashita's plan is on track. Now he has captured his first air base, he opens his bid to win the air war. Yamashita has twice as many planes as Percival, and it isn't just a matter of quantity, but of quality. Well, he had the Zero, uh, which was a very fine fighter and was probably, in its time, the best fighter around. His pilots were experienced, they'd fought in China, and so he had a huge card in that, in that sense. General Percival is at a distinct disadvantage. The Royal Air Force had quite a large fleet of very second 11 aeroplanes which had been procured during the interval between the First and Second World Wars and which really weren't fit for any kind of service other than just sort of looking good on flying displays. All that wouldn't have mattered if the Japanese themselves had had old-fashioned aeroplanes, but they didn't. Yamashita uses his superiority in the air to launch attacks on other British airfields in northern Malaya. He drops bombs designed to damage aircraft and kill soldiers, but which leave the runways intact so he can use them later. Within four days, Yamashita captures all the airfields in northern Malaya and destroys most of Percival's planes. And there is more disappointment for Percival. As news of Yamashita's invasion comes in, Battleships sent by British Prime Minister Winston Churchill set sail from Singapore to help defend Malaya. Japanese bombers sink them within hours. With the Navy and Air Force decimated, the defense of Malaya now rests solely with the Army. General Percival has two choices pull his troops out of Malaya, abandoning the people to their fate, and regroup to defend Singapore, or fight every inch of the way for the Malayan Peninsula. Malaya had great importance to Britain. It had 
two particularly vital commodities, rubber and tin. This was not just a stretch of jungle. This was a, a, a highly productive, highly desirable stretch of territory. And Churchill piles on the pressure. To give up any part of the empire without a fight will undermine Britain as an imperial power. Percival must hold his ground, whatever the cost in blood. The fate of the island is now in the hands of his infantry, but they fight with a handicap. They are saddled with rifles left over from World War I. Bob Podesta served in the British Special Forces. He has fought in the jungle with modern guns. He wants to see how effective one of these cumbersome antiques could be. A lump of clay represents a human body. straight through. As you can see, you've got a nice, neat um, entry where the bullet has entered the body, OK? And where the bullet has exited, you've got this massive wound, open wound, where uh, all the gubbins has come out, yeah? I mean, th this is a 303 uh, rifle, OK? And a 303 bullet is, is a very large bullet. It's a, it's a big round, big old round. Uh, Neanderthal, you know? <laughs> right, what we're about to do here is to see what has happened in the centre with the bullet. I think it'd be better if I did this. You can see where the bullet has uh, entered the body, look, and it's caused this massive amount of damage. The bullet has tumbled and fragmented inside the clay before exiting. The whole of this, uh, the man's internal organs would have been absolutely smashed. I'm very impressed with the rifle. The, the guy definitely wouldn't have survived if that bullet had hit this body. Armed with their old-fashioned but effective guns, Percival's infantry dig in and wait for the Japanese. Yamashita has a dilemma. Consolidate his position or take the initiative. The temptation is to stop and, and draw your tail up behind you and get ready for the next bit and have a quick breather. And he did not fall into that trap. He kept going. The risk he was facing was that he'd come up against some really serious opposition which would hold him up. And that he'd be eating through his ammunition, he'd be eating through his food. So he was banking on capturing what the British had in order to keep his momentum going. But it's a highly risky strategy, because if you don't win, if you don't get those supplies, you are completely banjaxed. You come to a grinding halt. So he did take a risk, huge risk. Yamashita wants to reach Singapore in weeks, but it is 800 kilometers down the Malayan Peninsula to the island. How can he move his 30,000 foot soldiers so far, so fast? Could he learn a lesson from Percival's troops? The British have been in Malaya for years. To march long distances along jungle tracks, they have learned to travel light. What we've got here on the floor is the complete set of equipment as carried by a British soldier in the Singapore campaign. Got his rifle, his gas mask, his respirator, boots, spare equipment, ammunition, the lot. The whole lot they suggested should be about 18 kilos, no more than that. And in fact, this is 18 kilos in water bottles. And it's worth saying that a unit of the Argyles marched 90 kilometers, 30 kilometers a day with that kind of weight on. In fact, if we put my volunteer here into 18 kilos of real weight, on it goes, buckle it all neatly into place, give you your gas mask, your respirator, on it goes like that, and then give you a rifle to go over your shoulder, you should be able to march through jungle. And in this case, um, this is our jungle, and you're going to do not 90 kilometers, you're going to do just a brief section. 
try it out. On you get. Okay. And uh, start marching. Happy? Very happy. Yeah, very happy. Feel comfortable? Yeah, it's fine. Why don't say yeah. you're doing a few kilometres time? Okay. Yep, no, it's fine. You're going to march now for an hour. At the end of an hour, you've got 10 minutes break. You can have a drink of water and back okay. on the treadmill. All right. I see you do. <laughs> but Yamashita wants his men to carry more so they can survive for longer without being resupplied. What we've got here is what a Japanese soldier's carrying. He's got at least 10 litres of water. He's got six kilograms of rice. The whole weight is 36 kilos. Bring it in, dump it there. That's twice as much as what our British soldiers are carrying. But to move it, you need a secret weapon. June, this is the secret weapon. This is the bicycle. The Japanese had two divisions. That's 30,000 men. And in those two divisions, they had 12,000 of these. That means that you can carry vast amounts of weight. Downhill, you can cycle. Uphill, you can push them. It's not a problem. Kate, you happy? With 12,000 troops on bicycles, Imashita plans to storm down the Malayan Peninsula in weeks. Speed and surprise was the key. Imashita's infantry was so good at keeping the momentum going using bicycles that he was able to have a sort of foot equivalent of Blitzkrieg. Bicycle Blitzkrieg, yes. <coughs> the British are left floundering by the freewheeling Japanese. How are you doing? <laughs> Feeling it now. It's very tough. Yeah. You're doing very well. Just coming up to an hour, okay. you get your 10-minute um, break. That's it. Take it easy. Yeah. Take it easy. Just put your rifle down first. OK? That's it. OK, I got it. OK. Respirator. Yeah, you've undone the string. Put your cap down. That's it. Good. And under your waist belt, and then just sit down. Just sit down. Yeah, just sit oh, down. Sit down. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Oh. Oh, exhausted. <laughs> you eventually get the rhythm. With the Japanese setting the pace, Percival is forced on the defensive. Once again, his Indian soldiers find themselves in the front line. Percival orders them to dig in and defend the road down which the Japanese are pouring south. It is a strong defensive position. It should hold out for weeks. The young Indian recruits expect an infantry attack, but the Japanese have another surprise in store. Tanks. Imagine the scene, monsoon rain absolutely pouring down, and suddenly down the road comes this well, you can hear it from a distance amongst the rain, the clanking of the tracks and the squeaking of the turret. And suddenly they're there, and they're going through you. You know, it's not a happy position to be in. It's not surprising people began to wonder what was going on, wonder what to do next. As the Japanese tanks charge ahead of Yamashita's bicycle army, terrified Indian soldiers break ranks and flee into the jungle. You, as a young man from the Punjab, uh, sitting in a jungle in Malaya, with the monsoon rain pouring on top of you, you haven't had sleep for four days, you've been shot at, you've been bombed from the air, your officers have been killed. You need to be a pretty sophisticated young man to say to yourself, hang on, I'm here for a real purpose here. The Japanese were not expected to have tanks. They were hopeless, pathetic tanks, but they were more than equal to the task because we had none. The British had no tanks. Very dismaying. They were very upset about the tanks. Percival has not got any tanks because the chiefs of staff in London thought they would not work in the Malayan terrain. Now, with his troops fleeing into the jungle, he is forced to withdraw. He has lost the first major land battle. To hold the enemy up, 
Percival orders his engineers to blow up steel bridges in Yamashita's path. But with stocks of British explosives falling into Japanese hands, they need to find a method that makes their dwindling supplies go further. By eking out their explosives to demolish as many bridges as they can, Percival's engineers gain him vital time to dig in. More reinforcements are on their way, but they won't arrive for two weeks. Percival must hold Yamashita until then. The ace in his hand is his superior artillery. At Kampa, halfway down the Malayan Peninsula, he finally manages to get his big guns into a defensive position and trains them on Yamashita's charging army. For the first time, General Percival is calling the shots. With the help of his artillery, he holds up the Japanese Blitzkrieg for six days. Yamashita is outgunned and outnumbered. His chief of staff recommends pause, bring up more people, and then mount a set-piece attack, you know, hey, what we used to call hey diddle diddle and straight down the middle, like that. He doesn't want to do that. Percival's artillery is well dug in among the hills of Kampa in central Malaya. Yamashita decides not to wait for reinforcements, but to immediately employ the scorpion maneuver. He sends one column forward to grip the British in its claws. Then he sends another column through the jungle to attack them from behind. This is the lethal sting in the scorpion maneuver. And it totally banjaxed and threw the British, who hadn't come across this sort of tactic. It was cheating. What he was attacking was the psychology of the enemy. And, 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 he, and the enemy, the British, were surrendering or giving up when they were outnumbering their enemy by 10 to 1. They, they, had, they had mentally run away from the battle. Yamashita writes this entry in his diary. New Year's Day, 1942. My duty is half done, though success is still a problem. I would like to achieve my plan without killing too many of the enemy. With the loss of Kampa, Percival is caught between a rock and a hard place. His frontline troops are disheartened and exhausted. Thousands of bewildered and injured soldiers flee into the jungle. Whole battalions are wiped out. Percival decides to change tack. He will turn defeat into victory. Tactical operational withdrawals can be very sound military maneuvers. They can be uh, uh, the precursors to victory. Um, uh, and there's nothing wrong with having a planned withdrawal if everybody understands what the point of it is and, uh, and when it's going to happen, and if you do it when you want to do it as opposed to when you're forced to do it. Percival decides to withdraw, giving up the central Malayan states and the capital Kuala Lumpur to Yamashita. He wants to concentrate his defences in the south, where new troops are waiting to hold the line. As Percival retreats, Yamashita chases him. Yamashita was actually leapfrogging his people. He had no reserves, so there wasn't much let up or rest uh, involved. There was no question of taking a division out of the line for a week to have a kip. They were pretty tired. And of course, time is not on his side in the sense that he doesn't know what reinforcements are coming. Control of the bridges is vital as they race south. Yamashita has to take them before Percival can blow them up. He relies on his soldiers to take the initiative. 22-year-old Sadanobu Watanabe rises to the challenge. In one morning, he leaves his tank four times to cut explosive charges on bridges with his sabre. Then he leads a cavalry charge against the enemy, all guns blazing virtually wiping out two companies, about 250 men. 
At the next bridge, he shoots through the fuse wire with a machine gun. He has captured five bridges in six hours. But such heroics are not enough. Yamashita fears Percival's bridge demolitions could delay the attack on Singapore by six months. Impatient for victory, he also turns to his engineers for help. How can he cross rivers fast if the bridges are down? Captain Bob Stork of the Royal Engineers wants to improvise a bridge quickly with the materials the Japanese had in the jungle. He's asked a local rugby team to help. OK, guys, the Japanese engineers have got to come up with some kind of rapid solution to cross all the gaps that the British are making. The gap itself just behind you is about waist high of water. Close your eyes and picture the scene. You've got two minutes to come up with a solution, starting from now. Go. Come on then, guys, it's looking good. Bob's Keep going. team start by building piers to support their bridge. Guys, remember you're in a fast-flowing current, all right, on the river. Your logs are floating away. It only takes 15 minutes, but it's not quick enough. In a fast-moving battle, every second counts. OK, well done. That was very, very good, OK? But it was over time and it was over-engineered. The, the Japanese come up with a novel way to speed up their work. They use humans as bridge props. The ways the Japanese did it was just using the engineers, the actual sappers, as the piers themselves. So what we want to try and do is lash two of these logs, the large logs, together. Once they're actually lashed together, we're going to pick them up on our shoulders and then position ourselves in stream. And we're going to do that in two minutes. Right, let's go. Come on then, guys, let's show it. We can prove it. Chrissy, step to the right, Chrissy. Step to the right. Let's have some good tight bindings, guys. Let's hold it nice and tight. Hold it. Take the pain and hold it. Hold it. Boys, hold it, boys. Come on, John Back straight. Hold it. Okay, guys, that was two and a half minutes. Well done. Good teamwork. Okay, well done. Thanks. Improvising like this, Yamashita crosses river after river. Soon, only a thin line of Percival's defenders stands between him and Singapore Island. Now, Percival's Australian troops enter the fray. They immediately make their mark. They ambush and kill 700 cyclists, most with their guns still tied to their handlebars. It is a good start. And in a further boost, Percival's reinforcements are beginning to arrive. When you send troops to a new theater of war, it's terribly important to give them time, literally, to acclimatize. But it wasn't like that in Singapore. Percival's new recruits are thrown straight into battle with no time to adapt to fighting and surviving in tropical conditions. Some pay a heavy price. At Muir, the newly arrived 45th Indian Division faces a deadly variation of Yamashita's scorpion maneuver. The Japanese Imperial Guards attack them from the front as Yamashita lands more troops by boat 30 kilometers to their rear cutting off their retreat. The 4,500 strong brigade is wiped out. Only 900 men manage to escape through the jungle to safety. Now, Yamashita's fanatical soldiers reveal a darker side. His Imperial Guards torture captured enemy soldiers and then massacre them cutting off their heads with their samurai swords. It is one of several atrocities where Yamashita does not step in to punish his troops. If soldiers get out of hand, they need to be brought back under hand very sharply and very quickly, and he had the power to do it. In the Japanese army, you could have a chap executed just like that, 
and he could have made an example of, of these guys in a way that he didn't, and I think he was morally at fault in that sense. A worried Percival writes to his superiors. January the 26th, 1942. Consider general situation becoming grave. May be driven back into the island within a week. Singapore Island sits at the bottom of the Malayan Peninsula and is linked to it by a causeway. On the last day of January 1942, a piper leads Percival's troops in a final retreat onto the island. They blow up the causeway behind them, turning the island into a fortress. The battle for Malaya is over. The battle for Singapore is about to begin. There you are, you've closed up, you've got everybody that you own, and you've got a very specific and clear task to defend Singapore now until you get reinforced again. You have no more major decisions to make, really. Now you have to fight the battle for the defense of Singapore. In just eight weeks, Yamashita's forces have advanced over 1,000 kilometers, fought 95 battles, and repaired 250 bridges. It is an extraordinary feat. But he has only 30,000 troops, and Percival has three times as many men holed up on Singapore Island. The British had a huge base in Singapore. I mean, it was stocked with ammunition, food. It was a, it was a massive base. Imashita has a couple of options, which is stop here, bring up my tail, regroup, rest, get everyone ready, collect my kit together, and then either sit there and starve them out, you hope, or mount an attack. A lot of the cards were stacked against him, so it's a formidable undertaking. Yamashita decides to strike fast, but where? To the east, where Percival is stronger, but the beaches are easier to land on? Or to the west, where British troops are thinner on the ground, but landings would have to be made in treacherous mangrove swamps? The mangrove swamps had all the elements of potential disaster because of the inability to control what's going on with guys wandering around in the mangrove in the dark being fired on. All the elements of potential disaster are to land in the mangrove swamp. It's the most difficult thing to do. It's the least obvious thing to do. Therefore, it's the right thing to do. Yamashita decides to launch a diversionary attack to the east to confuse Percival. Then send his main force across the straits in small boats to attack through the thick mangrove. Under cover of darkness, he readies a flotilla of boats for his secret invasion. Percival is daunted by the challenge facing him. How was he going to defend Singapore against uh, an attack uh, from a direction that he couldn't possibly predict with certainty? He had 70 miles of coastline to defend. And uh, by this stage, he couldn't in any way be certain that the Japanese wouldn't load troops into ships and come round the bottom. Uh, so he had to defend the whole perimeter. And he didn't have enough troops for all this. But in London, Winston Churchill is unsympathetic. He sends this message. I want to make it absolutely clear. But I expect every inch of ground to be defended, every scrap of material or defences to be blown to pieces to prevent capture by the enemy, and no question of surrender to be entertained until after protracted fighting in the ruins of Singapore City. Percival spreads troops around the entire coast. By trying to defend everywhere, he may not be strong enough anywhere. On February the 5th, 1942, Yamashita launches his diversionary attack. Then, while Percival is distracted, he mounts his main invasion, sending his boats across the Johor Strait under cover of artillery fire. Within an hour, Yamashita's troops have come ashore to surprise the defenders in the mangrove swamps. 
the British are overwhelmed and begin to fall back. Yamashita pushes on towards Singapore City. Again, the Japanese have, have got inside the decision loop, have totally discommoded the British and are rampaging towards Singapore City. As Yamashita breaks through his lines, Percival loses control of his troops. British and Australian soldiers desert en masse, head into town and riot. Civilians flee in boats as fast as they can. There is panic, chaos and confusion. Percival considers surrender, but Churchill is adamant. There must be no thought of saving the troops or sparing the population. The battle must be fought to the bitter end at all costs. Commanders and senior officers should die with their troops. The honor of the British Empire and the British Army is at stake. These are the sort of messages that, if they were going to be said at all, would have you know, been opening gambits, the sort of battle cry at the beginning of the campaign, you know, really charging people up with the notion that they're going to be victorious from the outset. But by this stage, even the most optimistic people know that the game is up. Percival is on the ropes, but Yamashita is also worried. He is running out of bullets and fears a street-by-street -street fight for Singapore City which he might lose. It's not a totally foregone conclusion. He is clever enough and, and wily enough to recognize that. You know, he's not stupid. All the time, he's thinking, maybe they're going to pull something off. Maybe I'm going to run out of ammunition. And my guys are going to get massacred or, or bled white fighting in a built-up area. Percival attempts to counter-attack with tired and confused Australian troops. The attack fails. After five days, all Percival's troops are now trapped in Singapore City. They have enough food for a week, but Yamashita's planes have bombed pipelines and reservoirs, and they are running out of water. General Percival faces the hardest decision of his life. Fight to the death or surrender. As Yamashita's troops besiege Singapore City, the lifelines of Percival's army are strangled. He sends his last signal to his superiors. Owing to losses from enemy action, water, petrol, food and ammunition practically finished. Unable, therefore, to continue the fight any longer. All ranks have done their best. Percival decides to surrender in defiance of Churchill. I think any fighting man, when he's uh, done what he can, doesn't like, in the end, to know that he's lost and that he's had to put his hands up. It's not something that you want to do and you do feel ashamed about it. Percival agrees to meet Yamashita to discuss terms. Now, Yamashita needs to pull off one final bluff. At the end, he was down for the, to the last few rounds. I mean, he was actually balanced on a knife edge. He thinks that when Percival comes, uh, suggests surrender, that Percival's going to demand his surrender. At the negotiations, when Percival is sort of havering and trying to sort of cut deals, he says, are you going to surrender or not? Inside, you can just imagine the tension building up. Are these guys going to talk me out of it? And so he's got to bring this to a stop. This hard, large, overbearing guy who's saying, give in or we'll just wipe you off the face of the earth, it must have been quite alarming. It's very interesting to speculate what would have happened if Purcell said, well, I'm not going to surrender, you better fight for it. No. Percival is surrendering at the end of his first and only senior command in battle. 
he will have been uh, internally wondering what he did wrong, what could he have done better to have stopped it. Poor man must have been d dismayed that he had lost Singapore for Britain. After an hour, Percival signs an unconditional surrender. Yamashita has taken the island and the whole of Malaya with the loss of only 9,600 men. The Japanese fate him as the Tiger of Malaya. His morals may be questionable, but his generalship is not. It was a fantastic achievement in my view. I can't think of any mistakes or bad decisions that Yamashita makes. Uh, throughout the campaign, I and mean, it's a faultless performance. I, I really can't think of, of any mistakes that he makes, actually. Churchill calls it the worst disaster and the largest capitulation in British history. 120,000 British troops are killed or captured. Percival clearly did make mistakes, but show me a general anywhere in military history who does not make mistakes, and I'll show you someone who's got delusion. Because, you know, we all make mistakes, generals, all the time. And it's certain that a different general would have done it differently. Would the outcome have been substantially different? Who can tell? General Percival spent the rest of the war as a captive of the Japanese, before returning to a quiet life in England. General Yamashita went on to fight in the Philippines. After the war, he was tried for atrocities committed by his soldiers. He was found guilty and hanged. 